Representative Mark Meek. Um, he is a small business owner who served in the U.S. Air Force, Air Force, coached high school football, and spent years as a dedicated volunteer in our community. In 2016, Mark was elected by the people of District 40 to represent them in the Oregon House of Representatives. Meek is the co-chair for the task force on addressing racial disparities in home ownership, which we will from now on probably just call the task force because that's very long. Um, please help me in joining, please join me in welcoming Representative Mark Meek. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Colin. Thank you again for joining us. Um, so I wanna start maybe with kind of the simplest question, which is how did we get a task force on racial disparities in home ownership and how did you find yourself co-chairing that task force? Very good question, and um, as actually in 2018, it was one of my bills to establish this task force. I'm a realtor, uh, Chris. Hello, Chris Bonner. She's a realtor out there to appreciate that. And also, I want to recognize uh, State Representative Alyssa Kenny Geyer, the chair of my Human Services and Housing Committee, here tonight. Um, and it was actually through working with uh, uh, Representative Kenny Geyer and other housing advocates that we've recognized that there are major disparities in home ownership of, of people of color in the state of Oregon. And so I uh, got the speaker's uh, support, Speaker uh, Tina Kotek's support, and established a bill that is, well, I um, sponsored the bill that established this task force in 2018, and it was approved and funded. And so since 2018 and through last year, we uh, worked with the task force to, be, uh, to develop this deliverable. So that's how it was started, but definitely there's a lot more background behind it. Oh, I bet. Um, so uh, help us, help ground us in, in the scope of the issue. And so when we talk about racial disparities in homeownership, is there a slight disparity? Is there a big disparity? Is it urban areas? Is it statewide? So what's the scope of the challenge we're trying to tackle? There's, it's a large disparity. So if you take the full population of Oregon, there's about 4 million you know, folks. And if you, if you look back, if, if you pull and extract how many um, Oregonians are actually homeowners, and you remember you have families, so those four million kind of aggregate down into homeowners also. And uh, so the state of Oregon on average has about a 63 or 62% uh, rate of homeownership of all of our population. So if you uh, disaggregate our, our white Caucasian population, um, in, in 2017, about 65% of the, the full white Caucasian um, uh, folks were homeowners. Now, the, if you look at um, our African American population and their full aggregate um, grouping, there was 35%, they were 35% homeowners. Mm -hmm. Hispanics were 43% homeowners and 46% for Native American. But even if you look at the 46% for our uh, Native Americans, compared to the 63 and 65%, that's a big disparity. And if you look at our, our uh, African American black population, that's almost a, a half percent. Mm -hmm. So there's large disparities and um, what we discovered through, I'm, and I'm a realtor, I'm, I've been advocating and, and working with anybody that wants to become a homeowner. I, I love it, I think it's the American dream, and I think it's, it's the way that you actually build intergenerational wealth and how you can help your families and, and just you know, really help the future and your own future, your own you know, benefit and self-worth. And uh, to get into this task force and the work we did, we discovered that you know, basically the systemic discriminatory practices that Oregon had adopted in its inception um, that wouldn't even allow like uh, Native Americans to own a home or even live in the state of Oregon. Uh, there was a lot of, um, a lot of uh, basically violence against folks, including African Americans could not live in the state of Oregon. And um, it, those practices and policies and attitudes um, people will say, well, it's, you know, it's 2020 now, um, things have changed. We work with fair housing laws and ethics and things, and you hear words like redlining and steering, oh, you don't want to live in this neighborhood, that's not going to be good for you. Uh, I was actually working with uh, one of our other representatives that came through our committee. Um, there are um, covenants, constrict covenants, uh, CCNRs, covenants, conditions, conditions and restrictions. 
uh, too many details going through my <laughs> yeah. head right now. But uh, there's actually still on the records in Southeast Portland and Bend that have uh, restrictions and line items that say no uh, African Americans, no Chinese, no uh, Hispanics can live in this neighborhood um, or can be on these, you know, on, in these neighborhoods after five o'clock or six o'clock. Crazy, and they're still written. And when I work with my clients and we do a title, re uh, title report and I'm going through those details with them, I'm looking through these just horrendous uh, yeah. statements going, well, these, those are illegal, so they don't, you know, they, you don't have to enforce them anymore. Well, we did put a law into effect in 2018, I think it was, that gave more ability to have those um, conditions struck in from the record and wiped out. There was some, you know, some argument saying, well, it's better that we should learn from our mistakes and be able to see those still. I think actually, Having a, a homeowner, you know, that's looking at a neighborhood that they're trying to, you know, loop, move into and, and, and adopt and, and feel proud of, seeing that language does not welcome them. And so I think it's we. That's some of the things we've done, but those practices and those attitudes uh, are pervasive and persistent. And they're continued. If you. Um, the uh, Oregon Historical Society just released a, uh, their winter report. Uh, called White Supremacy and the Resistance, and uh, started uh, reading that. I was just came out, and uh, one of the things I noticed was that part of our Bill of Rights, Oregonians' Bill of Rights, when it first was in you know the uh, organization of the state of Oregon, the Bill of Rights uh, had language in that uh, it only pertained to um, uh, any foreigners that were welcomed in were only white foreigners. Mm. And uh, th that language stayed on in our Bill of Rights in our Constitution until 1970. So only, you know, I was born in 1964, and so during my lifetime, that language was still as part of our Bill of Rights and our, our Oregonian history. Mm -hmm. So when people say it's, it's ancient history, I hope I'm not that old and ancient that they... <laughs> But there's, uh, so I know I'm this kind of going on, but Colin, I'm happy to answer any more questions. Yeah, or, yeah. I think, um, so in sort of doing a little bit of research ahead of today, um, I found a quote from you that I found striking, um, and I'm going to share that, and I apologize. It's always awkward to quote someone in front of them, but I think it's important. Um, and so you said to the scanner, I'm so pleased and proud of the work and commitment that all of our members put into this very difficult and potentially polarizing work. And so I was struck by that last piece. What the data you lay out is really clear. It's really objective. It seems really straightforward. There is a disparity. It's rooted in the history of the state. What would be polarizing about that? It's it's interesting. Um, we are we live in a world that uh, expects you to take responsibility for your own self, right? And and actually, I'm a this funny. We're sitting here in my old high school that I went to for three years, and they shut down. Oh. But it was a wonderful experience in education because we had uh, all kinds of folks of color, uh, with Hispanic, we had African American, and actually, even more interestingly enough, we had uh, refugees from uh, Vietnam and Cambodia. And I remember sitting on our stage watching some of the um, native uh, Cambodian dances, just as as a 15 year old, just in awe and of the beauty of what they were expressing. And so uh, I really, at that early age, I learned, you know, that um, that we all, uh, we're, we're a big world and there's a lot of us. And I think if we all listen to each other, that we can, you know, actually help and support each other much better. But the attitudes out there is that, hey, you have the same chance that I do to get a home, go out and get it, get a job. Mm -hmm. So it can be polarizing and what happens is the folks in this state that uh, are trying to get ahead have uh, faced, you know, it's like playing Monopoly. Uh, you get sent back to jail, you need to go pass go and you don't get to collect $200. And uh, so it's, you, you get, it's, it's harder to start from scratch and, and to begin and get a chance. So I'd love to talk more about some of the programs we're in, involving yeah. with this that will actually help some of our, our uh, families to achieve Amer the American dream. That's absolutely. So last fall, you published a list of, I think it was 13 um, preliminary recommendations. Yes. Um, I'm not going to ask you to go through that full list. Um, I would recommend reading the report um, if folks are interested in the details. But are there key pieces that you hope to convert into legislation and policy um, this session? Absolutely. And we just uh, passed out of the committee this uh, afternoon, 
with uh, Chair Kenny Geyer out there and our other committee members, uh, our bill, which has a fiscal uh, impact, so it's being sent to Ways and Means, but one of the major uh, uh, pieces of this and that we can implement and actually get uh, with the rubber meets the road is uh, we're getting funding and to the Oregon Housing and Community Services. Oregon Housing and Community Services is a state agency that works with both helping with our homeless, helping with down payment assistance, helping with keeping people housed. And so it's through them that they work with a lot of our nonprofits like Habitat for Humanity, Proud Ground, the Community Land Trust. And so we are funding and we're gonna be providing, um, we're look, hopefully we're shooting, I'm shooting for 11 million. I know that uh, Representative <laughs> Kenny Geyer out there shooting for 11 million, which is just a drop in the bucket. And let me go back to that. During our task force, we looked at this number of folks and if we were trying to make a dent in, next, in the next 10 years by 2030, how many lives and how many folks would be need to help per year. And we broke that down and, and basically the 11 million is just a starting point. Mm. And we need to invest those types of dollars for the next 10 to 15 years to really make a, a serious impact. But I think if we can, we're able to invest those dollars, part of those programs include education, financial uh, opportunities and, and credit re restoration and credit um, mm. Um, help with your credit scoring. For example, if you're a renter, you're not getting those high, high uh, ticket item um, credit you know, points, but we're looking to actually give you credit for your rental payments, have them reported to the, um, the big three, and it will allow you to bring up your credit score. And it'll actually show lenders and mortgage brokers that you can afford a big ticket item, and then we just need to help them with the down payment, down payment assistance. And there are some individual development accounts, they're called IDAs for short, and uh, we are looking to fund those where if you think about somebody that's trying to save, um, saving ten to $11,000 could take 10 years for some people. If you're only making thirty to 40000 saving anything is almost impossible. But with these IDAs, if you're able to save maybe, say, $500 that year, the state of Oregon with these IDA programs match, and they can be up to a three to four times match. So that same $500 turns into $2,500. Mm -hmm. And then if it's $1,000, you're gonna have 5,000. So we were able to leverage those dollars. We're actually helping um, folks to really learn the disciplines of basically budgeting, saving money, and being prepared for a rainy day, because being a homeowner brings a lot of responsibilities. But it's, it's not until you're able to get into the game that you can understand that and appreciate it. And people have, you know, are really proud of their possessions. And I know once we get folks the opportunities that it's going to make a big difference in their lives and their family and their, their, their children's and Absolutely. families. Absolutely. So um, big investment in IDAs, in Oregon, Oregon Housing and Community Services, and the nonprofits that house folks and help connect folks. Yeah. Um, are there when you sort of looked at the landscape of causes, are there some things that require sort of systemic fixes? Are there regulation issues? Are there um, either training issues or other compliance issues in lending or in realty or in other areas? Or is it really a, a money issue? Is it just we need to put a ton of resources into this? No, that's actually the great question because you lead me into one of the other recommendations we have. Um, as a realtor, mortgage brokers, you have uh, annual training, you have initial training to get licensed. And we put into statute that the Oregon Real Estate Agency, the, the um, commissioner, that part of a uh, professional becoming a trained to become a realtor, or well, not a realtor, but a real estate agent, that you have to have this training. And we're gonna, we made it uh, mandatory that they actually have to take this training, implicit bias training, mm -hmm. understanding discriminatory practices, understanding where we are at with these numbers, why they're of importance, mm -hmm. that uh, the marginalization of it is, is real. So it's not just the theory that we wanna show them the numbers. And then also uh, Department of Cons uh, Consumer and Business Services, DCBS, they uh, uh, monitor and they work with the mortgage brokers and mortgage lenders. So we are, their education requirements are gonna be the same. And uh, so that is the education process of it and the awareness of it. And not, by, and not until we really know what the true numbers are and, and the facts are, do you really take it serious? So mm -hmm. it's gonna be an education and a mindset change. And, um, and actually part of our training includes for property managers. So that's gonna be uh, really a, a very, very uh, helpful process. Yeah. 
So when you sort of walked us through those statistics, you highlighted in particular um, African-American communities and Native and tribal communities where there's sort of particularly big gaps um, or barriers. Um, do you see these kind of two main sort of deeper financial investment on the state's part, additional training sort of across industries? Will those two strategies sort of lift all boats or are there specific strategies for supporting African-American homeowners or Native homeowners? That um, it, well, part of uh, the programming with OHCS is, well, first of all, you're right, it, it, and it's interesting, you, may, you, you, you said, you know, raising all boats, a rising tide, and it's true in some cases that it will raise all boats, but if your boat has a hole in it that you mm -hmm. can't fill, or if you have anchored into a bad spot, um, you don't get the same advantages. So. What we are doing is um, the through this programs and through these program these this programming with OHCS and different nonprofits, we're able to um, both uh, not only um, change the mindset and attitude, but give more hope for opportunity. And uh, through the education, through the outreach, we're um, we're very tapped on the individual development accounts. It's probably one of the best resources for families to, to get the money and funds they need. So we're trying not to promote it too <laughs> robustly right now until we have enough thorough funding because sure. we hate somebody to come to the line and say, I want to get into this program, but we're sorry we don't have enough money to really right. support you right now. So those are the ones, we're tar part of our funding is we start have to targeting that. And um, Representative Kenny Geyer, she's been just amazing. She's a champion for housing. And what we really need here in Oregon is a dedicated uh, resource and fund, funding mechanism to help for housing and affordable housing and for our uh, folks that are struggling with uh, houselessness. So we don't have those avenues. We have to pull from the general fund. And uh, so as soon as we can come up with better ideas, mm -hmm. and she's had some great ones. They're hard to implement, though, and it takes a lot of political will and back. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, it, we're going to actually miss her ideas and, and her, her championing, uh, championing of uh, these many great programs. So. Absolutely. Um, so one of the challenges in housing policy in general, but particularly homeownership, is that some of the strategies is that we rely on housing both as basic shelter and as a wealth generation tool. And so a lot of the strategies that makes housing more affordable and accessible as shelter also dampens the wealth generation effect, right? So if you rapidly and dramatically increase supply, housing costs go down, that hurts people's ability to build equity, right? Like, mm -hmm. but it becomes more affordable. Is that something the, the task force grappled with? And is that something you're thinking about? Like the tension between accessibility and wealth generation? That's actually, well, it's a really good, uh, good point and good question. Um, We've, I study economics and I study the market trends and I'm always worried about, we, I suffered and <laughs> lived through the, uh, the Great Recession which was really housing related and I helped many folks go through foreclosures and short sales and try to keep them in their homes. One of the biggest, my pet peeves was these, we had these you know, hundred billion dollar bailouts that were to these mortgage brokers, mortgage companies that were supposed to help families refinance and re-amortize, reorganize their loans. And I actually sat in meetings and on phone calls, hours and hours, working with people, trying to help them to get the opportunity to do so, to have them go through months of work and applications and return phone calls and missed mails and to just be denied mm. because they missed it by a day or they didn't, they weren't qualified enough. That was ridiculous because they ended up losing their homes. Mm -hmm. And now these same folks, if we would have helped them with ten thousand dollars back then, could have still been homeowners, could have been healthy, and and so. Back to the, um, the, uh, the appreciation rates, the, uh, the market, with we are in such a uh, negative supply and mm -hmm. we have high demand that there's nothing, on average, if you look historically since the Great Recession of 1930, mm. that homes have been on an upward trend of appreciation at the range of 3 to 5 percent just historically, and you can go back through 2008 and the drop and loss of about 50% equity, we have already recaptured that and it's where people are gaining above those numbers. Mm -hmm. So the supply will actually, actually, it probably will be for, you know, if we can actually bring the supply on. Right. It would probably lower, it probably kind of keep a steady market rate 
and but not go negative at all. It won't lose. Nobody will new, lose pop property value. It just probably won't gain at the same rate that like just a few years ago was up to 10, double digits, 10 and 12 percent. Right now we're looking more of a healthy, you know, appreciation market, which is about three to five percent. And uh, so I don't see it uh, damaging or the equity opportunity. It's, 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 it's a great uh, just opportunity. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much. I am again getting flagged that it is time to wrap up. These 20 minutes go by so <laughs> fast. Um, I want to especially say that we are so grateful um, for everyone who made tonight's program possible. Thank you to our speakers, Representative Mark Meek, Jana Gastelum, and thank you to all of you for joining us, and thank you to the Portland Housing Bureau and Oregon Community and Housing Services for sponsoring. We invite you to stay and continue the conversation. One more round of applause for both of our speakers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great job. Thank you. Thank you too.